Welcome. Um, my name is Molly Nikolai and I'm with the Appalachian Sustainable Agriculture Project. We can go to the next slide. Today's webinar is um, really focused on crop insurance and helping you give an overview of what crop insurance options there are for farms in our region um, and really determining if that is a good option for managing risk for your farm. Our primary speaker today is James Robinson from uh, Rafi International. Um, he's a research and policy advocate. I'm uh, the program director for ASAP's um, local food campaign. And um, this webinar series is, the, is brought to you um, through some funding from the USDA Risk Management Agency and in partnership with Rafi Farm Service Agency, Cooperative Extension, and ASAP. Next slide. Um, James will give a little bit of an introduction of who Rafi is and what kind of work they do. Um, ASAP is, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, we are a regional nonprofit serving the Southern Appalachians, and our mission is to help local farms thrive, link farmers to markets, and support and to build healthy communities through connections with local food. And feel free to visit our website or call to learn more about the services and materials that we offer. Next slide. This series of, web, of workshops is designed to help farmers in our region manage risk for their farm. Um, when, when I ask people about how they define risk for their farm, people usually talk about crop failure and weather or insect damage. And yes, this is what we call production risk. And that's what this part of what this um, webinar today will be addressing with crop insurance overview. But other types of risk include marketing risk, financial, legal, hu or human resource risks. And no matter what type of, of risk we're looking at, um, we're talking about planning is one of the primary ways to reduce these risks. And being part of workshops like these today will hopefully offer you a look at some of the options you may have for reducing risk for your farm. Next week, we'll be looking at options for managing financial risk um, through accessing capital for your farm. That can be connecting with loans or grants or cost share programs. And then on the 24th, we'll be focusing on managing marketing risk which is more of my area of expertise and we'll be discussing strategies for diversifying your market options and focusing particularly on local markets and branding your farm as certified local. So um, please put um, check out those other webinar series. Today is a recorded webinar, so there won't be the opportunity for you to ask questions live, but feel free to email um, James or myself if you have any questions. So I will hand it over to James now. All right. Well, thanks, and, and um, uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to this recorded webinar. Um, uh, my name is James Robinson. I work for the Rural Advancement Foundation International. Um, we are uh, a nonprofit that's based in Pittsburgh, North Carolina, that does work with family farms uh, around the country. Um, primarily, we work with farmers um, who uh, oftentimes end up in, in some form of financial crisis and um, we try and do what we can to um, help that farmer stay on uh, their land and pass that farm on to the next generation. And uh, all of our other programmatic work is, um, is really in, in one way or another designed to um, make sure that we see fewer farms in, in financial crisis. Um, but uh, to, to sort of uh, put it uh, the way, um, you can see on the slide here that, that Rafi combines on-the-ground services with policy and market advocacy in order to ensure that farmers have the opportunity to make the right choices for their farm and families, and that these are also the right choices for the environment and farming communities. So that's Rafi in a nutshell. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? Um, well, this, this webinar will be split into three sections. Um, I will give a brief overview of crop insurance and talk a little bit about why Rafi works on crop insurance and why it is important to us um, and, and why we think it should be important to farmers and, and to our agricultural system. Um, the next section will uh, look at whole farm revenue protection. Uh, this is a new policy that was made available for the 2015 crop insurance year and is in a three-year uh, pilot right now. 
uh, and we'll give uh, an overview of that, and, and we will also look into the uh, changes that have been made to the Non-Insured Crop Disaster Assistance Program, or NAP. Um, that program has seen some significant reforms as a result of the 2014 Farm Bill, uh, and we'll talk about why those may be important for your farm. So crop insurance, um, an overview, why does Rafi work on it? Um, so let's start with the overview. Um, let's say, for the sake of simple math, that on average your farm earns $1,000 in revenue, um, and this is what's expected in 2015, and you decide that you want to insure that revenue, um, and that you want to insure it at an 85% coverage level, meaning that you want to insure 85% of that revenue. Um, well, to figure out what is going to be covered, how much revenue you can guarantee, um, it's really simple math. You just multiply your $1,000 in expected revenue times your 85% coverage rate, and you get $850. And that's what you can expect to, um, uh, to make based on what your insurance guarantees, um, what you can expect to make at, at least. Um, so let's say that hail hits a week before your harvest this season, that you've bought 85% coverage, um, and it wipes out 50% of your crop, leaving you with $500 in revenue for that year. Well, $500 is certainly less than your $1,000 in expected, and it's also less than your $850 in insured revenue. So let's take a look at what that means. Um, here's the chart uh, on the right that shows $1,000 in expected. Um, $850 covered and $500 in actual revenue. That's what you actually made after the loss. And in this scenario, you would get a $350 indemnity payment because if you would uh, be brought back up to that $850 coverage level. That's the guaranteed income that you had based on your crop insurance. Um, so just to make sure that we, we've got it, we've got how crop insurance works, um, let's take a look at one other example. Um, we've got the same $1,000 and same 85% coverage level, uh, but this time around you have minor flooding in a single field um, that brings your revenue down to $900. And in this scenario, your uh, $900 is actually above your $850 uh, guarantee uh, based on your coverage level. And so in this case, you get no indemnity. So you would pay premiums for the year, but you would get no indemnity, much like you pay premiums for car insurance, but hopefully you don't get in an accident, and so you, you wouldn't uh, have to file a claim and collect on that. And, and that's uh, what we see in, in this particular scenario. You've, you've paid premiums, but your, uh, your revenue didn't drop below that coverage level, so there's no indemnity payment. Um, so now that we have this understanding of, of sort of the, the very basics of crop insurance, um, let's talk a little bit about why RAFI works on this. Why is this important? Um, and to put it very simply, you can look at um, what's written here on the top of this slide. The structure of lending and crop insurance programs drives investment and production decisions long before a disaster takes place. What that means is that crop insurance is important for two reasons. It's not just a safety net. While it, the safety net that it provides is very, very important um, and is a worthwhile thing to provide in and of itself, it's not the only thing that crop insurance does. It is also um, a tool for farmers to build their credit worthiness um, because you can collateralize your debt with crop insurance. Um, so this graphic uh, here in the, in the middle of the slide um, will explain some of the challenges that farmers have faced based on the um, historic structure of crop insurance. Um, so historically, uh, we're going to start here on the left, uh, in the left box, um, under crop insurance. Historically, crop insurance has not been designed to cover specialty crops, um, diverse operations, or livestock producers. Um, and creditors, historically, have had limited recognition of production-based risk management, um, like crop and income diversification. And when we say production-based risk management, we mean things that farmers do to internalize their risk, like diversifying their crop income across crops or planting cover crops in order to ensure that um, they have better yield results during droughts. Um, and because creditors have not historically been able to quantify the benefits that you get from these production-based risk management um, practices, they have required crop insurance. 
and so the farmers have a decision to make. Um, with the sort of full range of options that you have as a farmer to be a specialty crop farmer or to be a, a row crop farmer or a livestock farmer, um, farmers have um, taken those options and realized that uh, many of those options, like growing specialty crops and incorporating livestock into production, aren't going to help them access credit um, because it's not going to insure, they're not going to be able to get insurance for it. And so farmers find that there are limited credit opportunities for these specialty crop and diversified and livestock operations. So when we say the structure of lending and crop insurance uh, programs drives investment uh, production decisions long before disaster takes place, that's what we mean. Farmers are making decisions based on the kind of crop insurance that's available um, before uh, before disaster ever takes place. Um, so what does this mean for especially crop and diversified and livestock farmers? I mean, there, there are significant impacts that, that this structure has. Um, one is that um, if obtaining credit is difficult for especially crop and diversified producers, then it's harder to access land. Um, it's harder to get a, a farm ownership loan. Um, producers are more likely to farm under production contracts, uh, and production contracts are a way to um, have some guarantee in, in income, but oftentimes we find are, uh, are not fair deals for, for the farmers. Um, and it's harder to expand operations. So if you have a really interesting idea, but you need credit to help you put that idea into action, um, the lack of crop insurance and risk management programs is going to make it more difficult for you to access credit and, um, and implement that idea and expand your operation. Um, so this brings us to uh, uh, the two products that we're going to talk about today. Whole Farm Revenue Protection is a new uh, risk management program that was created through the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, and after that, we're going to talk about NAP, uh, which was also uh, reformed through the 2014 Farm Bill. And um, these are two new options that have not been available uh, in the past that are really uh, changing the structure of risk management programs for specialty crop growers and are changing some of these problems that we've been talking about. Um, there, there are new opportunities for specialty crop and diversified producers to uh, uh, ensure their operations and uh, improve their, their credit worthiness. So, so let's jump right into the first. So why is whole farm revenue protection important? Um, well, it is multi-peril insurance. So it covers a lot of different things. So if you have pest-related losses, that would be covered. Weather-related losses, it would be covered. And actually losses um, in price caused by uh, a natural event would also be covered um, by this crop insurance policy. Um, it also uh, very, very uniquely um, incentivizes diversification. I don't know of another insurance policy anywhere um, that does something like this. Um, it will insure multiple crops um, at once without requiring you to purchase multiple policies. Um, and the premiums uh, that you will pay will actually be reduced as you grow more crops up to seven crops. So the incentive there. Um, and it will actually cover crops and livestock together. So it covers that um, diverse uh, operation that's, that's trying to um, uh, produce sustainably. Um, so what's covered by whole farm revenue protection? Um, so as far as crops, any agricultural product established or produced on your farm operation except timber, forest, and forest products, animals for sport, show, or pets. Um, and it covers livestock up to 33% of revenue or $1 million. And uh, over the last few months, RMA has been requesting um, recommended changes to uh, this policy um, that could be implemented in the second year of the pilot. And uh, one of the things that they heard a lot was that the 35% uh, cap on livestock revenue was uh, keeping a lot of farmers out of eligibility. So we hope that in the next year or two um, that cap will be removed. Um, we don't know this, uh, but, but we hope that it will be removed and that will make many more producers eligible for this 
uh, insurance product. Um, so events um, that are covered, uh, it ensures against uh, loss of approved revenue due to unavoidable natural causes that occur during the insurance year. Uh, this includes decline in both crop yield and price as long as the decline can be linked to a natural cause, i.e. weather related. Um, and the actual language from the policy says a uh, decline in local market price will be presumed to be from unavoidable natural causes unless uh, the company or the FCIC, that's the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation, um, is able to specifically identify a man-made cause that resulted in a measurable change in the price. So what that means is that there's a bit of a gray area around what na what a natural cause of um, uh, is for a uh, drop in price. Um, but what RMA, the risk management agency, is saying there is that they will presume uh, something, uh, a presumed drop in price was the result of, of uh, a natural cause unless it's very, very clear that it's not. Um, so a, a bit of a gray area, but that, that definition helps uh, a little bit. So what's not covered by whole farm revenue protection? Um, so you can think of these things as um, unnatural causes. So as far as yield, um, negligence, mismanagement, wrongdoing would not be covered. Uh, the act of a person rather than nature, so chemical drift or fire. Um, water uh, contained by a dam or reservoir, damage to machinery or equipment. Breakdown in irrigation equipment or practices when not related to natural cause um, and theft or vandalism um, are not uh, covered causes of yield loss. Um, and price loss, um, uh, causes that are not covered would be quarantine, uh, boycott, or refusal of anyone to accept commodities, uh, lack of labor, uh, deterioration of commodities and storage unless due to unavoidable natural causes. So those are, those are things that would not be covered by whole farm revenue protection. And again, you can think of them as unnatural causes of loss. So why did prior whole farm revenue crop insurance policies not work? Um, it should be known that whole farm revenue protection is not the first time we have had a whole farm policy. Um, there were two prior policies um, that, uh, that were available all the way up through the 2014 crop insurance year, and those were called adjusted gross revenue, or AGR, and adjusted gross revenue light, or AGR light. Um, and they were really underutilized nationwide, um, and especially in North Carolina. Um, one of the problems was that these policies were geographically limited. There were many farmers in many states that were not eligible for the uh, crop insurance policy simply because they, they were only made available in a few locations. Um, the coverage was limited. Um, you could only insure 72% of your uh, average adjusted gross revenue, which was less than um, the, the coverage that most farmers were looking for um, based on the, the cost of the policy few farmers expected to uh, ever have a loss that was going to be significant enough that it was worth their um, uh, premium costs uh, to, to purchase the policy. Um, so along these lines, it was expensive. Um, producers frequently reported the policy was not cost effective for them. Um, there was difficulty expanding coverage. Uh, producers were required actually to show a history of crop insurance, or excuse me, of crop expansion in prior years before being able to expand coverage. So even if you had had steady production over the prior um, five years and you had a new buyer um, that was going to allow you to expand your operation, um, all of the expansion would be uncovered, essentially leaving your farm um, uh, pretty underinsured. Um, so that was that was one of the big challenges that, that producers uh, faced. That, that once you had this insurance, it was difficult to expand your operation. Um, there was a low liability limit, so there was a one million dollar liability limit, um, and then only three policies as a result of all of this, all of these issues. Only three policies were sold in North Carolina each of the last three years. Um, so again, really underutilized. Um, so let's look at whole farm revenue protection now. This is what we currently have, and all of the states there that you see in yellow um, are areas where whole farm revenue protection is, is available and AGR and AGR light were not available. So uh, large portions of the, uh, the Midwest have now um, been provided in, uh, a whole farm insurance product that had, had not had access to it in the past. Um, there's still a region in the Mid-South, uh, five states there in the Mid-South that do not have 
um, access to whole farm revenue protection currently. Um, however, uh, Secretary Vilsack has um, said um, in Congress, has testified in front of Congress within the last several months um, that uh, the USDA and the Risk Management Agency uh, is working to expand whole farm revenue protection to those five states in the Mid-South. So um, that would that would be a huge um, uh, thing for those producers in the Mid-South that, that don't have this uh, whole farm insurance option, but we, um, uh, based on, on what we hear from Secretary Vilsack, we think that the policy will be expanded soon, hopefully by the next crop insurance year. Um, so let's take a, 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 a close look at the differences between AGR light, AGR and whole farm revenue protection and, and sort of compare. Um, all three of them are uh, revenue coverage, so it ensures your farm's revenue. All three require five years of tax history, um, so your revenue is based on your, your average of your five years of tax history. Um, they all have this diversification incentive that allows you to um, include uh, new crops and receive a, a premium reduction. And the uh, coverage level is where we start to see some changes to the whole farm policy. Um, and you see those changes listed in red there. So the coverage level for whole farm actually goes up to 85%. Um, and that's more, of course, than an 80% coverage level, but it's made even more significant when you look at the payment rate uh, just below. The payment rate for whole farm revenue protection is 100%. Um, so you can sort of think of this as like your coinsurance. Um, what this means is that 85% um, of your uh, of your coverage is going to be um, is going to be paid out fully to you. 100% of of that um, coverage level that you you purchased um, under AGR and AGR light, the best you could do was a 90% payment rate. So you had 80% coverage and then you had a 90% payment rate below that, which meant your coverage was essentially more like 72% coverage. Um, so it was, a, it, was, it was a bit complicated and um, meant that farmers sometimes were not um, receiving the payments that they thought they were going to get based on the coverage level that they had. Um, but the 100% payment rate under Whole Farm clears up some of that confusion and it means that the 85% coverage level is a true 85% coverage level. Um, perhaps most significantly, um, actually I think I will say outright most significantly, the um, uh, maximum subsidy under whole farm revenue protection went up from 59% to 80%. Uh, what this means is that 80% of this policy is paid for by uh, the taxpayer and the federal government and that the farmer only pays 20% of the premium. And because the payment rate, or excuse me, the, the subsidy uh, under Whole Farm went up to 80% from 59%. It means that this product is much, much cheaper than AGR and AGR Lite. So if you're a farmer that looked at AGR and AGR Lite and thought, hmm, that's, that's not cost effective for me, looking at Whole Farm may be uh, worth your time. Um, it, it will be a significantly uh, cheaper product for you. Um, it does cover po uh, post-production expenses. Um, with AGR and AGR Lite, we found that farmers were having to back out um, costs like packing and packaging and washing and labeling that they were doing on the farm, but after harvesting. Um, and whole farm revenue production doesn't uh, require that farmers back out the costs associated with those things. So um, this product is is actually getting you closer to ensuring your 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 actual revenue. Um, and then the liability limit has gone up significantly as well. Um, there was a $1 million liability limit under AGR Lite, um, $6.5 million under AGR, um, and whole farm revenue protection uh, is actually at $8.5 million. So you can ensure uh, uh, much more revenue under whole farm than you could under AGR Lite or AGR. Um, but how much does it cost? Um, so this is the, the question that we generally get first, um, and it should be the first question. Um, and the answer to this um, is it depends. <laughs> Unfortunately, the answer is not really easy, uh, but we'll do our best to, to give you an idea. Um, it depends on how much revenue you want to insure. Um, it also depends on the premium level that you want. So your price will be different based on 
choosing an 85% coverage level or a 70% coverage level. Um, the specific crops you grow um, and how they interact will also affect the price. Um, and how you grow crops, whether you have uh, more diversity or less diversity, um, will also affect the price. Um, ultimately, the price must be settled with your agent. Um, what we tell you here today shouldn't necessarily be taken as um, uh, a, a, an exact indication of what your premium will be, but you should talk to a crop insurance agent to find out exactly. Um, for your own purposes, if you just want to uh, run your farm uh, numbers through uh, a tool to find out how much this would cost for you, you can do that um, on the USDA's website. And that tiny URL uh, that's provided there, um, you can copy it down and put it into your web browser, and that will take you to uh, the USDA tool that will allow you to run your farm numbers on, on whole farm revenue protection and get the cost for your farm. Um, but let's take a look at an example scenario right now so that we can try and get a sense of what this policy might cost. What's the ballpark? Um, so in this model farm example, um, we're going to take a mid-scale specialty crop commercial operation. Um, the farm has $1.2 million in revenue a year and is on 215 acres. And that $1.2 million in revenue is split evenly across three crops, uh, cucumbers, bell peppers, and tomatoes. And if you look down at the bottom, uh, what you'll see is the producer uh, paid premium based on the insurance coverage levels. Um, so let's look at the 75% coverage level, for example, and we'll see that the total premium you would pay for this crop insurance product, um, if this was your farm scenario, this $1.2 million in revenue, would be $24,300, and the per acre cost would be $113. So let's look at a little bit different example. Um, and and this, is, this will help us uh, illustrate to you how crop diversification impacts your premium. Um, let's say that same farm with $1.2 million in revenue adds watermelons. Um, but they only add $30,000 worth of watermelon revenue. And that's going to be 3% of their overall revenue. Um, let's look down uh, at the bottom of the slide at the 75% example again. This is 75% coverage level uh, for your insurance. Um, the total cost of this insurance um, in this scenario would be $24,660. Um, now, there is... Um, a difference there of about $360 more than the first example we gave with only three crops. And this is confusing, right? Um, you know, we've been saying that as you increase the number of crops, your premium goes down, and you've increased crops here, and your premium just went up. That doesn't make any sense. Well, the reason it went up is because watermelons don't account for a significant amount of your revenue. Um, it's a very, very small amount of your revenue, so you've not really diversified your crop income very much, even though you've added a crop. Um, and so since some of your income has been diverted from cucumbers, bell peppers, and tomatoes without really diversifying your overall income, the cost of this product has gone up for you by about $360 uh, total. Um, let's look at the next example. Um, and this really illustrates what happens to your premium if you concentrate your crop income in just a few crops. So we're looking back at the original example again with just the three crops, cucumbers, bell peppers, and tomatoes. But in this scenario, your uh, crop income is really concentrated in cucumbers and tomatoes. About 84% of your income is coming from cucumbers and tomatoes. And with this 75% coverage level example again at the bottom of the slide, um, the total cost for that farm would be $26,460, uh, and that's a difference of about $2,160 more. So because uh, bell peppers uh, count for such a small amount of your crop income and um, the rest of your income is concentrated in two crops, this scenario is going to cost you more than the first scenario that we gave you. Um, and then finally, let's, let's look at one more example of, of what really combined uh, diversification looks like. So uh, we say combined because we mean crop diversification and income diversification. Um, and this is really what RMA is looking for in this policy. 
Um, we've added another crop. We've added watermelons, um, and and we've added three hundred thousand dollars in watermelon revenue, and that is um, that means that our income is spread evenly across all crops. Each of our crops accounts for twenty five percent of our revenue. And if you look at that 75% example again, if you wanted 75% coverage, um, the total cost of this policy for this farm that makes uh, $1.2 million in revenue a year is $23,580. And the difference there is actually $720 less. So by adding an additional crop, you have reduced the overall cost of your uh, insurance by $720. Um, so how can I calculate premiums for my farm? Um, we showed you this earlier. I just want to show you this again. Um, this is the uh, tiny URL that you can copy down and put into your web browser, and this will take you to a USDA calculator that will allow you to calculate uh, this for your farm. And we're going to take a look at what that looks like right now so that you are uh, prepared to, to use the tool when you get an opportunity to run your farm numbers through that. Um, so uh, we're going to click on Quick Estimate. This is the screen that you'll see um, on the USDA's website. And down under Most Used Links, you'll see Quick Estimate, and you want to um, click that. And you will see um, some options like this, uh, Commodity, Commodity Year, State, County, Type, and Practice. And you will want to fill in your information. And for Commodity, you'll want to put Whole Farm Revenue Protection and fill in the rest of your information. And on this uh, screen that you'll see next, um, you have uh, some more information to put in. Um, you have your uh, MPCI liability. You'll want to put in zero for that unless you have other crop insurance um, on your crops as well. Um, and you have your allowable revenue, which will be based on your historical revenue for the last five years. So you'll need your last five Schedule Fs. And you'll put that information into those boxes. And then um, you will go through your, your, your uh, um, drawing this year and put in your commodity values. Um, and you will get your expected farm um, output report and revenue. And that is going to um, bring you to this screen here, which is going to give you the uh, cost of the insurance um, at the various premium levels. You see that down at the bottom. And you can also click on some different um, uh, tabs uh, just above that that will show you the producer premium amount. Um, it will show you the uh, subsidy amount, which is uh, what the federal government and the taxpayer is uh, covering. And uh, you can also click on the uh, total premium amount. Um, the, uh, the worksheets will give you more specific information about your farm and um, you'll be able to take some of that information to a crop insurance agent that you may want to uh, uh, talk to about purchasing Whole Farm. So what additional reforms are needed? Um, I've mentioned that this policy is new. It was required by the 2014 Farm Bill. It's in a pilot year now, and then RMA is still working on reforms uh, during the pilot phase. So what do we need to work on? Um, well, the first, I think, is that beginning farmers do not have access to whole farm revenue protection until the seventh year of farming. That is because there are five years of Schedule F tax records required. Your farm needs five years of tax histories, uh, of tax history, and one lag year um, in order to access this, uh, this policy. Um, there is not an option to build a history using transitional yields or county averages, as there are with many other policies. Um, so we're working right now to figure out how to make this uh, policy available to beginning farmers and um, to uh, the risk management agency's credit, uh, they, they, they recognize that this is, uh, this is problematic and have uh, actively engaged in uh, uh, many conversations about how to uh, make the policy available to beginning farmers. Um, so let's talk about now. This is a non-insured crop disaster assistance program. Let's, let's give an overview of some of the changes that were made to this uh, program. So um, you can purchase NAP on a crop-by-crop -crop basis. So instead of insuring your whole farm, like whole farm revenue protection, 
you're just pur purchasing NAP on a crop by crop basis. Um, you can purchase um, 50 to 65 percent um, coverage of your yield, um, and, and there are no price changes within that 50 to 65 percent range. Um, that's a significant difference from what farmers historically knew as NAP coverage. Historically, NAP uh, was 50% uh, coverage at 55% of the price. So essentially, your farmers insured at about 27.5%, um, which is the reason farmers like to refer to NAP as not a penny um, or say things like um, a NAP indemnity payment was enough to take your family out to dinner. Um, those things were not far from the truth. Uh, it wasn't great coverage. So to have 65% coverage and a 100% payment rate for NAP uh, really significantly changes this policy and, and, and the kind of uh, program it, it, it is for farmers. Um, NAP only uses USDA official wholesale prices, so uh, data and record keeping are very important for NAP. Uh, NAP is managed by the Farm Service Agency, um, not the Risk Management Agency, which is an important difference. So you don't buy NAP from a crop insurance agent. Um, you purchase NAP through your farm service agency office, um, and, and it's, I should uh, say that NAP is not um, technically an insurance product. It is a risk management program, um, but it is not technically insurance, and it's run through the farm service agency. Um, as I mentioned just a moment ago, record keeping for NAP is really critical. Uh, NAP requires daily, uh, a daily record of pounds of each crop sold at the end of each season, um, and four to ten years of established yield. Um, you can use county averages in most cases, um, but there is a penalty. Um, but what that means is that beginning farmers can be covered uh, by NAP, since there is not um, a requirement that producers um, use their own history, beginning farmers can access it. Although it's with a penalty, they, they can't access it. Um, there is a maximum payment of $125,000 per farmer per year. Um, and for this past year, the sign-up um, was in late November, um, but uh, on most years, uh, NAP has rolling deadlines um, depending on the crop. So what you would want to do as a farmer interested in NAP coverage is contact your farm service agency office um, for your county or your region and, and um, inquire about the uh, NAP sales closing dates for the crops that you're producing. So let's look at a NAP example, sort of like we did with whole farm revenue protection. Um, and let's imagine a farm with cucumbers, greens, and strawberries. We're going to look at the strawberries, since we insure on a crop-by-crop -crop basis. Um, strawberries are the highest uh, revenue crop on this farm, with an expected revenue of $2,975. Um, the uh, premium calculations will work as follows. Um, let's uh, assume you have 233 four-quart buckets, um, approved yield, and a maximum coverage of 65%. Um, and we're going to we're going to use these uh, this data to calculate the uh, the premium. So we'll multiply those 233 four-quart buckets by um, 7.6 dollars. Uh, uh, that's the wholesale price from USDA, and um, we'll get. Um, a total um, revenue of $1,771 um, expected for strawberries. And um, we're going to cover that $1,771. Sorry, there's a typo there, actually. Uh, so let's do the math with $1,711 um, and multiply that by the 65% covers level. Um, so what that means is that we're going to have um, uh, $1,151 insured. That's the insured amount of, of revenue we have for strawberries. And uh, we take that insured amount and we multiply that by 5.25%, um, uh, um, which is the premium rate uh, mandated by the Farm Bill, that 5.25%. And that, that gives us $60. So that's the premium rate for this uh, $1,151 in, um, in covered uh, income. And then we actually have to add to that a $250 administrative fee per crop. 
So for strawberries, the total cost to insure $1,151 in revenue is $310. Um, and then after the subsidy, the farmer pays 40% um, of the premium. And uh, so you multiply 310 times 40%, and that gives you um, uh, $124. Um, and important for beginning farmers, um, the administrative fee is actually waived for beginning farmers. So if you're a beginning farmer interested in NAP, and uh, this looks like it may be a, a lot for you to pay as a beginning farmer, um, you can actually back out that $250 from this equation, and it will uh, pretty significantly uh, reduce your premium and hopefully make this product pretty affordable for beginning farmers. There is a decision tool that farmers can use uh, for NAP as well, like there is whole farm revenue protection. Um, this can be found on the USD uh, farm, uh, farm, uh, farm service farm service agent. Add it on this slide. Um, again, just copy that down and put that into your web browser. Um, and this tool will help you determine whether or not NAP is available for your crop in your county. Um, in, in general, it, it should be available for your crop in your county if there is not a single crop policy available, um, meaning there's not a policy that, uh, that the risk management agency has developed that covers um, your uh, crop. So, for example, in North Carolina, if you grow blueberries or if you grow apples, there are single crop policies for those crops, um, and so NAP is, is not likely to be available in your county for those crops. However, if you grow, grow strawberries, um, there is no single crop insurance policy for strawberries in North Carolina, so NAP um, would be available. Um, and then you can also use this site to get a, an estimate on your premium for NAP, uh, as I mentioned. Um, so let's do a, uh, a recap. Uh, crop insurance um, can replace part of crop income when it's lost as a result of natural events. That's basically what crop insurance is there for. Um, it's the safety net. The second thing that crop insurance does is it can be used as a tool to increase your credit worthiness. Um, it, it can help you when you are talking to a lender um, about getting a farm ownership loan or a farm operating loan um, because that lender knows that you have some guaranteed income. Um, and it allows you to access credit without putting your land or your home up for, uh, up as collateral on that loan. So it, it, it's a, uh, a safety net for you in that way as well. Um, so we talked about two products uh, for specialty crop and diversified producers. The first was whole farm revenue protection. Um, it ensures the revenue of a farm. Um, it uh, provides um, a diversification incentive in the form of lower premiums for um, diversifying your crop income, um, but it does not cover beginning farmers. Um, uh, NAP, on the other hand, does cover beginning farmers. Um, it is an FSA risk management program um, covering crops that do not have a single crop policy, as I mentioned. Um, and if you're a beginning farmer, um, uh, it will not only cover you, but the administrative fee will be waived, and so hopefully it will make um, NAP a, a more affordable product for you as a beginning farmer and, and, and can help you both in terms of a safety net and um, a way to build your credit worthiness. So with that, um, I will conclude uh, uh, my uh, portion of the webinar, and um, my information is on the screen here. Um, please, anytime, feel free to email me at the email address listed there or uh, call my office number. Um, I, I'll be happy to answer any future questions that you may have about um, crop insurance and um, how it may uh, uh, provide a safety net for your farm or a, uh, an ability to uh, increase your credit worthiness. So with that, thank you. Thank you, James, and thank you everyone for attending and um, look for our other two webinars coming up in the near future or their recordings. All right, bye.